In this video, we're going to be talking precisely about what Catholics believe, what Catholics truly believe, because there are many people who say what we believe and all over the internet. And books and TV shows say what we believe, but 99% of the time they're inaccurate, incorrect, and have erroneous information, half-truths. And so in this video, we're going to be showing exactly what we believe. So if anyone, anywhere, at any time wants to know what Catholics believe, this is the video for you. Hello and welcome to Catholic Truth. If you haven't been here before, please consider subscribing if you like this video. We are an organization that teaches all about the Catholic faith and helps Catholics and non-Catholics to understand Catholicism, why we believe what we believe, and how it can change your life. First and foremost, Catholics believe in one God, obviously, and we can find this in Isaiah 44 through 46, where the Bible says there is only one God. God. And he's the creator, the sustainer. He's the one who made everything. He's the eternal, uncreated being who is above all, who is in all, and over all. He is God, the supreme being. But we believe while God is one, we believe in the Trinity. So one God in three persons. While not a perfectly accurate representation. St. Patrick in Ireland used to talk about the three-leaf clover and how there was one flower but three leaves. Three distinct leaves, not separate from each other, but one. So we believe that God is one God, but the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit make up the Godhead. So we believe that Jesus is God, and this is the central teaching of Christianity, so that if people don't accept the divinity of Christ and the Trinity— they're not considered a Christian or part of the Christian religion. And of course, this would include Islam. This would include the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Church of God, and a few other small cults. But the Trinity is what we believe in, the divinity of Christ. And we'll have whole videos on this. But the divinity of Christ goes back to the beginning of Christianity because Jesus, we believe, is a divine person who took on a human nature. It's called the hypostatic union. He was not a godly figure in a human body. No, he took on a human nature. So he was fully God and he was fully man. In fact, John 1.1 1, 1 said that the word Jesus was with God and Jesus was God. And then in verse 14, it says that he became flesh. So he took on human flesh and he walked among us so he could come teach us, instruct us, forgive our sins, reconcile us back to God and die for us on the cross so that we can have our sins forgiven and be brought to heaven. Interestingly, while Jesus's body was taken in nature, the Bible says that Jesus himself is the word of God the wisdom of God, and the power of God. These are three eternal attributes of God, which he cannot live without. If God didn't have his power or his wisdom, he couldn't know anything. He couldn't create anything. And the Bible says that these are Jesus, who is intimately one with his Father, which is why Jesus is saying the Father and I are one in a special, distinct way. So they're one in nature, but distinct in person. We also believe in the Holy Spirit, which you can find in Genesis chapter 1 and in Hebrews 3, 7 through 9. And the Holy Spirit is the one who is in us. He's in all baptized Christians. And he guides us. He sustains us. He comforts us. He leads us. He empowers us. And he helps us to follow God. He teaches us what is right. He is our counselor and he is our guide on this world. He's the one that Jesus left with us at Pentecost. So the Holy Spirit is the power of the universe and very powerful, and he lives within us to guide us and help us to live out the gospel and follow Jesus with all of our heart. We also believe in angels. We also believe in men. Angels are angelic beings, meaning they don't have bodies. They're spirit like God, whereas human beings have bodies bodies. And we were put on this earth by God, but unfortunately we rebelled against God. And God said, do not eat from the fruit of the tree to Adam and Eve. He gave them a test. And in that test, they chose or they failed to follow God correctly. They chose to disobey him. In fact, the devil said, you can become like God just by eating from this fruit. You don't need God. So the first sin of Adam and Eve was to become God. They tried to be God without God. And so they fell and brought sin into the world. 
pain and death into this world. We believe that God created the world perfect, but it was the sin of man and the devil together who brought sin and death and pain into this world. And this is why the Bible says we are supposed to die for our sins. This is why the Bible says we're going to die, because the penalty for sin is death. When you rebel against God who gives us life, then you choose death. But God didn't want us to die. And even though the Bible says that we can't get into heaven with even a single sin on our soul, God didn't like that. He didn't like the fact that men fell. He didn't want to be separated from mankind. He still wants mankind to come to heaven. And so he was going to send a savior into the world to die in our place. Now, God doesn't need to die because God didn't commit the sin. Man did. But man can't pay back an eternal debt. Only God could do that. So God became man in the person of Jesus Christ to take our sins, to die for us on the cross, and to make a passage to heaven again. He made it possible for our sins to be forgiven, for us to be reconciled to God, and for us to go to heaven by his death on the cross. He shed his body. He shed his blood. He paid the price for sin. And now through following him and through giving ourselves to him through faith, we can can be saved. We can come to Jesus. Anyone at any time from anywhere with any past from any religion can come to Jesus Christ to be saved. Jesus says in John 14, 6, that I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. Nobody can get to the Father, to heaven, except through me. And the Bible says in Acts 4:12 that there is no other name under heaven by which a person can be saved except through Jesus. So only Jesus can save us. It's only his body and blood which can forgive our sins. It's only his body and blood which can pay our debt and can reconcile us back to God and can open those gates of heaven for us. That is why Jesus is the only way to heaven. In fact, that is a Catholic teaching. And Pope John Paul II got an enormous amount of flack when he wrote the encyclical Domini Jesus, which said that Jesus is still believed to be the only way to heaven. And we can't learn anything from any non-Christian religions because they don't have the truth. The fullness of truth and the fullness of divinity is found in Jesus Christ who gives us this truth. And so we don't need to go to the different religions around the world to look for this truth because there's nothing they can teach us in regard to doctrine. So Jesus Christ is the only way. This happens through faith and repentance as it talks about in Romans chapter 3 and 4, and as it talks about in Acts 2.38 in different passages, it says that we must come to Christ through faith. It's faith that opens the door to his life. It's faith. And, and not faith, faith is not just believing. Faith is believing, accepting, repenting, and following. It's being obedient. The word believe in the Bible also means to follow and be obedient. So not only do we have to accept Jesus in our life. Not only do we have to believe in him, but we have to give our life to him and follow him. Matthew 28, 19 talks about discipleship. It says, go out and baptize all nations and command them in everything that I have taught you and baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So we have to believe in Jesus. We have to follow what he teaches and we have to be baptized and follow his commandments. In other words, we have to be his disciples. We can't just say it with our mouths, but we have to live it out with our lives. This is why we believe that we have to pray to Jesus and not just say a couple prayers before you go to bed, but have a good relationship with Jesus. It's not just something we do on Sundays, but something we should do every single day of our life. Being a follower of Christ is not something we do. It's something we are. It's our whole being. We make our decisions with him in mind. We seek to follow his will. We seek his guidance in our life. And we must follow Jesus and seek Jesus with all of our heart, all of our mind, all all of our soul and all of our strength. And Jesus says, if you do that, then you will bear fruit. And if you love God, then you will bear fruit and you will be on your way to eternal life. So we believe we have to live out this relationship with him every single day. And we believe that we have to uproot sin from our lives and by his grace and by his power working in us, uproot these sins and these idols in our life that don't belong to him.
We believe that God gives us his grace in a special way, uh, in many ways, but in a special way through the sacraments, which are signs, invisible signs of a visible reality, meaning God working in our lives, giving us his grace. And this happens through baptism, through confession, through the Eucharist, through confirmation, through anointing of the sick, holy orders, and marriage. These are all the seven sacraments that we believe in as Catholics. And if you look in the Bible, in Mark 16, 16, it says, He who believes and is baptized will be saved. In John 3, 5, it talks about how we must be born again through water and the Spirit, which refers to baptism, in order to enter into the kingdom of heaven. So these aren't just things we're adding to Christ or trying to work our way to heaven. These are commands that Christ has given us, and we're just obeying those things that he has laid down and that we follow. And we've made videos on a lot of these topics and a lot of these sacraments, if you would like more information. We have a whole video on the Eucharist, for example, which can be found in Matthew 26, 26, John 6, 55, or 51 through 55, uh, Confession, which is John 20, 21 through 23, 1 Corinthians 5, 17 through 22, and other verses as well. And the anointing of the sick, Matthew 5, uh, 14 through 16. And we believe that the sacraments, therefore, are biblical because we believe as Catholics that our beliefs have to explicitly or implicitly be found in the Bible. All of our beliefs come from Christ, but we also believe that they can be found explicitly or implicitly in sacred scripture. The Bible, tradition, and the teaching magisterium of the church are all important and all necessary according to Catholics. You can't just have the Bible alone. Protestants have the Bible alone, and they can't agree with each other. They have no authority over each other. There's no way to settle the problem without an authority. But Christ gave that authority to his church. There's so much more that was not written down in the Bible. There's so much more that was there for 400 years before the Bible was even made in the year 400 by the Catholic Church. So we believe that we have to go by the whole tradition, not just the part that was written down in sacred scripture, but the tradition that was given to us by the apostles helps us to understand and interpret the scriptures correctly. And it's the teaching authority, the magisterium of the church that has that authority from Christ to interpret the Bible correctly. It's the same authority that the Catholic Church had to make the Bible infallibly in the first place and to choose the canon of the scriptures. Some people think that our tradition is above the Bible, but it's not. That's actually false. The tradition is a servant, in a sense, to the Bible. And in some sense, it's a little bit below the Bible because the Bible is the Word of God, but it helps us to understand the sacred scriptures. And we can find this tradition in passages like 2 Thessalonians 2.15, where Paul tells us us to hold on to the traditions that he handed on. So we believe that we have to have the scriptures. They're necessary. They're the word of God. They're infallible from beginning to end. They're true from beginning to end. That is what the Catholic Church teaches. They're the word of God. But we also need the tradition which came before the sacred scriptures, which was around even before the Bible, the New Testament started to be written. And we need both because they both complement each other and walk hand in hand. We also believe that Jesus started the Catholic Church on the rock of Peter in Matthew 16, 18, and 19. He said, you are Peter, and upon this rock, actually Simon's name was Simon, and he said, you are now rock, kepha, Peter, in English. He said, you are rock. He literally changed Peter's name to rock and said, you are rock, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And then he gave Peter alone, singular in Greek, the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Now, the other apostles received a similar authority in passages like uh, Luke 10, 16, and in Matthew 18, 15 through 18, and Matthew 28, 19, and John 20, 21 through 23, and other passages they all received authority, but only Peter received the keys of the kingdom, which is why he has a primacy and a head authority. So we believe that Jesus started a teaching and preaching authoritative church. He did not start a Bible church. He could not start a Bible church. Nobody could even read. Most of the world couldn't even read till modern times. And in fact, there was no Bible until the year 400 when the Catholic Church made the first Bible. And then it took three years to copy a single Bible. So they were extremely 
rare for centuries and centuries, and even after that, they were extremely expensive, and most people couldn't read them. So Jesus didn't start a religion based on a book. He started a church, a teaching and preaching authoritative church built on the apostles, who continued his legacy, who continued to teach and preach, who continued to forgive sins, who continued to work miracles, who continued to lead people to heaven and preach the gospel as Jesus did. So this is the church that we believe Jesus started 2,000 years ago on Pentecost. In fact, the Catholic Church is the only church that can trace its lineage back 2,000 years to Pentecost. No other church can do that. Every other church has a founder and a year it was started and a reason why it was started. And this authoritative church has a hierarchy. Yes, we believe that it's the people of Christ. Yes, we believe it's the body of Christ. But it's not just individuals. The Bible says that it's made up of bishops and priests and deacons. These are three offices mentioned in the scriptures. And if you don't have these offices, then you don't have the true church. And in fact, these offices are the authority that people have in these offices, or as part of these offices, as a bishop, as a priest, as a deacon, was passed on in the Bible through the laying on of hands. The laying on of hands passed on that authority. So again, most churches do not have these things. And even if they do, they can't trace their lineage back 2,000 years to Jesus Christ and the apostles. So yes, we believe the church is the body of Christ, and we can't have the head, Jesus, without the body the church. And we also believe that it's an invisible and visible organization. Of course, the apostles were visible. The bishopric, priests, deacons, all visible. If you have problems, you needed to take it to the church. How can you do that if it's invisible? So we believe in an invisible and a visible church. And of course, I mentioned this already, but we believe in a pope. We believe that the pope is a bishop. All the apostles were the first bishops of the church. But the pope who is a bishop, the Bishop of Rome, has a special primacy because he alone and his successors received the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And if we look back in Isaiah 22, it, anyone who receives the key receives an office of special primacy and of special authority, which all the other authorities in the land did not have. So Peter received this special authority, and that's why we believe the Pope. He's not, in, he's not infallible himself. He's only infallible on issues of faith and morals. When speaking from his chair, And infallible statements in the church are extremely rare. I mean, most people don't really know that the Pope uh, doesn't make a lot of infallible statements. He can't preach on science. He can't preach on math. He can't preach on or teach on uh, what to do for the lottery. I mean, some people say that whatever the Pope says, you think it's perfect. No, <laughs> actually, the Pope has a wide range of sayings from his opinion all the way up to infallible authority and, and anything in between. So we have to look at the statements individually. As Catholics, we believe in heaven and we believe in hell. Eternity. God asked us to follow him. And if we do, and we believe in Jesus Christ, then we can be saved because Jesus will forgive anyone from any sin, anytime, anywhere. And he wants to bring everybody to heaven. So we believe in heaven. It's eternal bliss, eternal happiness, and an eternal relationship with God forever and ever. But we also believe in hell, eternal damnation, in a sense, really what it is, it's a rejection of God. It's where we don't want to live with God. It's people who prefer evil. They don't want to live with God, and they choose that by living not in God's means. Because, I mean, even if we are living for hell, anytime we turn around and say, I want to be forgiven, God can forgive us because of what Jesus did on the cross. So we believe in heaven and hell. Jesus himself said in Matthew 7, there's two roads. One leads to heaven, and it's hard to find. It's hard to travel on. Most people don't find it. Whereas the road to hell, it's easy, widely paved, and people follow it because they just don't want to follow God. And then, of course, we believe in purgatory, uh, which I'm not going to talk about now because we literally just made a video on that. And we have a bit video on where you can find that in the Bible. So I would direct you to both of those videos, which, if I remember, I will post at the end or below in the description section. I'll post a lot of our videos below in the description section if you would like to do more research on these. We also believe in the communion of saints, meaning we don't believe that God is a mean father who doesn't like you to talk to your brothers and sisters, your mother, or anyone else in your family. And he gets enraged if you talk, talk to anyone or look at anyone except him. I mean, this is kind of the anti-Catholic Protestant mentality sometimes. But we believe that, really, Catholicism, the church, 
heaven. It's a family. We are all part of the body of Christ. We are all part of the family of God. And in fact, in Hebrews chapter 12, it talks about the cloud of witnesses who surround us. And that is the saints, those people in heaven. They're constantly watching over us. They're constantly cheering us on to holiness. They're constantly praying for us and cheering us on so we can go to heaven and achieve salvation like they already have. Saints, for us, are like the heavenly hall of fame. They did it to perfection. They followed Christ with an extraordinary life, extraordinary holiness. They did things that were kind of ridiculous and impossible. They faced all odds. They faced persecutions. They loved God with all their life, all their mind, heart, soul, and strength. And so for us, they're really just hall of famers. They're people who we want to follow their example. In the Bible, in Corinthians, Paul says, imitate me and follow me as I imitate Christ. So whatever he does good, we're supposed to imitate. And so it's the same thing with all the saints. We have a whole army of brothers and sisters there. We don't see them as competition to Jesus, and we Jesus is going to get mad if we talk to our brothers and sisters instead of him. No, we're all one family, and we're all helping each other get to heaven. We're all praying for each other. We're all loving each other. And it's a family, and that's what the body of Christ is. You can see this in 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 27, Hebrews uh, uh, 12, 1, Ephesians 5, and other places as well. We also believe that the saints can pray for us and that their prayers are powerful because the prayer of the righteous man avails much with God, as it says in James 5, 16. And the saints are perfectly righteous in Christ's righteousness. He has perfected them. And when we go to heaven, we are going to be perfected. We are going to be powerful. We are going to be like God, the Bible says in Corinthians. And so we're going to be filled with God and they're already there cheering us on and praying for us and helping us to get to heaven. We also believe that man Mary was especially blessed by God. All God's choices are perfect, but God's perfect choice to bring salvation into this world was through Mary. So we believe that God blessed her in a special way. And in fact, in Luke 1, 28, he greeted her, hail full of grace. Now, many times in the Bible, when God greeted someone, uh, he told them their strength or he told them, you know, some Something that was defining about them and their ministry forever, like uh, strength or like wisdom. But Mary was hailed as full of grace, meaning she was perfected in God's grace. And the, I'm not going to get into it because we already have a whole video on it. But we believe that God blessed her in a special way and, and perfected her so that she could perfectly bear the perfect Son of God. That she could be made a tabernacle for His heavenly majesty. So the Immaculate Conception has nothing to do with Mary. It has everything to do with Jesus, that he was someone so wonderful, so special, so awesome, so majestic, so perfect, and so holy that God prepared his tabernacle ahead of time so that she could sinlessly bear the sinless Son of God, who is perfect. It's all about Christ, because Christ is eternal. He's almighty. He's Lord. He's King. He's Savior. He's Redeemer. He's everything. And he's the one that we praise and worship and adore with all of our mind, heart, soul, and strength. But we also recognize that the Bible says to honor those who God honors and bless those who God blesses. And so we do. God honored Mary. God blessed her. And in fact, Luke 1 48 says all generations will call her blessed. So that's what we do. We honor and bless her. And many people misunderstand our Marian devotions and they think it's worship. They think we're bowing down to her. They think we're trying to be saved by her and nothing could be sa further from the truth. We believe that she's nothing without God, literally nothing without God. The only thing Mary has, even if she is queen of heaven and earth, which we believe it's all a grace and a gift of God. She literally has nothing without God. She's nothing. She has no, not literally has nothing. She's dirt. She's dust compared to his eternal almighty majesty. Even St. Louis de Montfort says that in his opening page that Mary is less than dust compared to the eternal wisdom who had no need for Mary, who still today does not need Mary. But he chose Mary as part of his plan and chose her to bring salvation into the world. And he blessed her and he honored her. And that's what we recognize as well. We're not praising the painting. We are praising the master artist who did such great work in her. These are the basic doctrines and beliefs of the Catholic Church. There are, of course, many more beliefs that we have and many more doctrines as well. And we've made videos on them. So if you would like to know more about Jesus, we have videos on him. If you would like to know more about purgatory, about hell, about Mary, the Immaculate Conception, her perpetual virginity, why we believe that Mary didn't have other children and where it's found in the Bible and history, 
You can find that anywhere because we believe that if you go back and read the lives of the earliest Christians and you read their writings, we believe that they were all Catholic. They claimed to be Catholic, distinctively Catholic. They believed Catholic doctrines, Catholic teachings, just like we do today. And so if you go back and read the earliest Christians, you will see that the Catholic Church does go back to the time of Jesus Christ. And it has been one holy Catholic and apostolic church for two thousand years. And of course, if you would like to know more information, we have a link down below which says questions and you can submit your questions to us and we'll get back to you when we're able to. And uh, we're hiring a team of people to help answer your questions because we really want to answer your deepest, darkest questions. And we're going to be having some more live streams soon. We're going to be having Q&A nights. So please put your questions down below if you have some. And again, if you're new here, please, and you like this video, then please subscribe to this channel and please like this video. In fact, like it like six times, you know, maybe I'll get six likes for it. <laughs> Just kidding. But seriously, please like the video. Please comment. Please subscribe because all of these things help to make this video more powerful. And please share it with the world so that people can know what Catholics truly believe and not what everyone thinks we believe. Lastly, please consider supporting our ministry so that we can continue doing our work. We need monthly supporters, one-time supporters, yearly donors who can give $10 a month, $25, $50, $100, 200 and even some bigger donors as well for our future plans and everything that we have in store. Thank you so much for watching and God bless you.